Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on returning guest, Mike Render. Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Nice to be back. Glad to have you. Mike, you did a fabulous job in Going Clear. And I want to talk today on the show about Going Clear and the impact it's had. But before we do, last year when we talked, I asked you for your prediction on 2015 for the Church of Scientology, and you said, pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And pain, <laughs> and pain there was. Was it worse than you thought it would be? No, it wasn't worse than I thought it would be, Jeff. It, w it was about what I thought it would be it would be i mean a number of those things were uh that came to fruition 2015 and been in the works for a long time so there was some predictability i think that uh perhaps what was a bit surprising was how many other people jumped on board and i think that goes to the subject primarily of going clear because that that in my mind was a real game changer well, I wanted to do a compare and contrast. The biggest thing uh, the church had previously faced, arguably the biggest thing, was Time Magazine's 1991 piece, uh, Richard Behar's article, Scientology, The Thriving Cult of Greed and Power. Right. Now, you were uh, in the church when Richard Behar and Time Magazine came up with their article. And what, what stood out to me, because I remember reading – uh, the magazine when it came out. And for me, I was thinking, well, this is going to be fun to watch because I remember it, the Church of Scientology took out full page ads in USA Today every day for 12 weeks. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, very well. What, what was the thinking on the full page ads in 1991? It was uh, fill the vacuum, you know, like let people know that there is another side to the subject of Scientology. It's not just uh, what you may have read in Time magazine. You know, of course, at that time, my perspective was that the the uh, as is the inculcated view of every Scientologist that the media is, are merchants of chaos and they are seeking to uh, destroy man's only hope and that the Time Magazine story was uh, nothing but a, an attempt uh, following in a long history of efforts to undermine and undercut and destroy the subject of Dianetics and Scientology. Um, you know, and if you look back at that article, uh, there was a lot of information in there, but there was also a lot of stuff that was, you know, Stephen Fishman was a, a key source for that article, and Stephen Fishman is now spending 20 years in a federal penitentiary for being the con man that he was at the time that he conned Rich Beha into believing a lot of the stuff that he had said. That is what I believe is the fundamental difference to be made between Beha's article in Time magazine and the Going Clear film, that the Going Clear film relies on, you know, uh, reliable sources who actually have information or experience about which they talk. And, you know, there, were, there, there certainly was some of that in the Time Magazine article, and, it was, you know, it's not like that article was all wrong. I think Rich Beha was perhaps a little ahead of his time. In fact, with his um, assessment of Scientology being the thriving cult of greed, which has uh, certainly proven to be true in today's world. Uh, it's about the only thing that you can identify about Scientology is the in astonishing levels of avarice and, and greed that it displays. Well, that's certainly characteristic of, of the church and has become more pronounced <clears throat> over time. Uh, perhaps especially as you, you've covered on your blog, and Tony has, it's become more about IES cash donations, you know, less about service. Yeah, well, it's a, a you know, 
It's IES cash donations. It's donations to build buildings. It's donations to uh, send way to happiness booklets to who knows where. It's donations for volunteer ministers. It's donations for anything and everything. Uh, David Miscavige's birthday gifts, um, you know, who knows, whatever they can think of next. I mean, I, I put on my blog this morning, the newest thing they have is nuclear bracelets. <laughs> I saw that, that they were per Mr. Hubbard's specifications, whereas they had not been prior to that. Um, and I was going to ask you, while we're on this subject, to digress, if you have your state of clear invalidated and you have to do CCRD and redo clear, do you have to buy another clear bracelet or do you get to keep it and they take it back? And it, I mean, it gets it gets really silly. Yeah, well, I know that if whoever that guy is, what's his name? Colin Davey was the one that, that sent out that message. He seems to be the the uh, designated mouthpiece now for this bizarre stuff. I guess if he had his way, the answer to that question would be, you have to buy one every time we tell you to just buy another one, whenever that you is. Know if, but, you know, if Colin were thinking, I'm a marketing guy, right? If he were thinking, he would sell sec check bracelets because you would have more of those sold than clear <laughs> bracelets. But, but I digress. <laughs> Mike, going back to, going back to uh, Time Magazine. Yeah. This is one big difference I noticed in doing my research for our interview. February 14, 1992, David Miscavige gives Ted Koppel his first television interview. Inside of the church, what was the thinking of putting Miscavige up with Koppel? Can you give us some background? This is really fascinating to me. Well, the thinking was that, that someone needed to get out there and you know, present a face of Scientology to the world, and Miscavige didn't believe that there was anybody else that could actually do it, so he took it upon himself to do. Um, you know, the reaction or the response to Time Magazine was very, very different than what you see the reaction and response to Going Clear or Leah Remini's book or, you know, even BBC Panorama or anything else that's come out subsequently. At that time, the, the church took out those ads in USA Today, as you quite correctly pointed out, sued Time Magazine and its contributors, did a massive a uh, quote investigation which resulted in a lawsuit being filed against Eli Lilly and um, Hill and Knowlton, the PR firm, uh, published a huge quote expose unquote of the connection between Time Magazine and Eli Lilly and Helen Knowlton and this guy called Martin Sorrell, who was the head of the WPP group that had bought Helen Knowlton. Um, and it was a, a, a sort of a massive response and reaction that went beyond what you see today, which is have a lawyer send a few letters and piles of quote unquote DA documents after the fact. It was a it was a, an enormous response, actually, probably out of proportion to to the uh, the size of the or the import of the article. Today, when Going Clear comes out, the only thing that the church has done is sent goofy legal letters, put up silly videos that try and impugn the, the uh, reputation of Alex Gibney, uh, Larry Wright, and anybody else who participated, and take out an ad in the New York Times accusing them of perhaps being uh, Rolling Stone Virginia Tech or Virginia. Virginia University or whatever it was, redux. I mean, it's pathetic, and they don't have anybody that will stand in front of a camera. They don't even have anybody that will talk to anybody from the media. I mean, all statements from Scientology now are sent as emails, and those emails are, you know, 
theoretically signed by Corinne Powell, but Corinne Powell doesn't have the authority to send anything, so they're all actually written or dictated by Miscavige. And this is the extent of the the response and the reaction that comes from Scientology. And I, I was going to say when you said, you know, let's talk about going clear, to me the interesting thing about going clear is what happened subsequent to it. It started an avalanche. It started an avalanche of people in the media realizing finally that there is nothing to fear from the Church of Scientology other than they're just going to test you to death with emails and phone calls. I mean, their, their, their weapon of choice is pestering emails these days. And that is uh, now very apparent to everybody. It had been the case for a long time, you know, the Tampa Bay Times has done numerous, numerous articles about Scientology that in previous years would have would have resulted in all sorts of reaction, and they just send them lame letters that the Tampa Bay Times puts on their websites. They didn't sue or respond or react to the BBC. They didn't do anything with Vanity Fair, they didn't do anything with anybody, Janet Reitman, nothing. All the threats in the world have turned out to be hollow, and now everybody knows it. And today, the, the state of affairs with respect to Scientology is, you're pretty much free to do and say anything you want. I mean, when South Park did their piece, there was a massive effort to stop that. I mean, everybody and their mother was involved in it, all the way from CAA and Tom Cruise to Tommy Davis and his uh, mother reaching out to try and speak to Les Moonves, da, 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 on and on and on. And today, it's like a, a whimper. Nothing happens. And we see... Saturday Night Live doing a, a brilliant parody of We Stand Tall. We see John Oliver now taking pot shots at Scientology routinely, Stephen Colbert doing it, uh, Billy on the Street doing it a, a couple of weeks ago about Leah Remini, and it just has become, uh, you know, to use the Scientology vernacular, their fair game for the media now. Wow, that's going to hurt for them to hear it. It's um, it's almost uh, karmic in the sense of, of of it coming back to haunt them. And three three things that come to mind, Mike. When I saw you on uh, Fox with Megan Kelly, yep, I thought those were outstanding pieces, and I'm glad Megan Kelly covered them. Something that I saw as a viewer watching that here with Karen. Megan picks up a statement to read that was faxed in right before airtime <laughs> that the church sent in protesting. And she's obviously irritated. I'm thinking as a viewer, well, why don't they have someone on camera with you? Right. I mean, they, they have Scientology Media Productions. They've got Golden Era. They've got Mad Hatter. They have a huge amount of overcapacity for broadcast. Why don't they put a talking head from the church on with you to say, no, Mike Render, no, this is how it really is. And M Megan Kelly, who's so good at what she does, you could tell she was irritated. Now, this is a loss of face for the church. But going back to Time Magazine, their response was so enormous, it was almost to use a corporate term when a, a corporation goes to war against, you know, a, a competitor. Yep. They'll often call it, let's take out the trash. That means let's comprehensively sue, file lawsuits, uh, patent infringement. But you know what? You go down the laundry list, right? Yep. It will almost look like a taking out the trash. We're going to get rid of all of our enemies all at once. And in fact, the time uh, Warner lawsuit was for $416 million, an unheard of amount. Right. And the church alleging false and defamatory statements. Something that happened at the same time, and this was pre-tax exemption, the church sued the IRS, 17 senior IRS officials, for $120 million. So this, at that time, does the church 
more coherent, more focused? Does it think it can knock off its enemies in a once and for all final assault? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I think that, that probably they still do. <laughs> it's just that, you know, they're, li- they're like the, the Black Knight in, in Monty Python. I mean, <laughs> the, they, they still talk tough, but they're, they're bouncing around on, you know, stumps of legs and no arms saying, come on, come get me. Come on. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take you out. And and everybody is now looking at them and go, they've got no arms. They've got no legs. They're bleeding stumps, and they're still bouncing around, threatening. Well, what a joke is that? And that wasn't the case back then. In fact, though that Time Magazine lawsuit was ultimately lost by the church, it did have an effect on the media. Because Time Magazine spent a lot of money to defend that lawsuit. A lot. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. So it it was still back in the heyday of, you know, you you better be careful about what you do and say when it comes to Scientology. These days nobody really cares. I know that they still send out these huge letters and big packs of dead agent information and stuff, but everybody's gotten pretty inured to that. Everybody in the media knows that that, that stuff is coming and that's it. <laughs> but, but realistically, Mike, the dangers posed to the Church of Scientology by suing the media, anyone in the media, whether it's HBO you know, Time Warner, whatever, there's more downside risk to them suing. And when I think of it, their main downside risk is they actually have to either produce David Miscavige or Linda Hamill or their church officials, or they have to talk about, you know, why free speech is this shouldn't apply to them. I mean, they couldn't put together a credible lawsuit these days, could they? No, not not a chance. I mean, the real problem that they have, Jeff, is you touched upon it. First of all, David Miscavige can't go into deposition. And every article and every story now is a, a, touches upon him and his reputation because he has made himself the one and only person in the Church of Scientology that has any uh, significant meaning, any significant function or role in anything, in everything, and thereby he becomes the focus of all, you know, if they were to file a lawsuit, all discovery, and that discovery would not only go to whatever the, you know, trying to prove the allegations of the lawsuit at hand, There is another defense in that sort of a lawsuit, which is you are basically a libel-proof entity. You have no reputation to protect. Nothing that is said about you can damage you because you're already so damaged. It would be like, you know, ISIS couldn't file a libel suit saying, well, you're calling us bad names, (laughs) And, and neither can... Scientology and David Miscavige because all that would happen is any good litigator would go through and start listing down, well, these are all the things. Is this true? Is this true? You're accused of doing this. You're accused of doing this. There's been this media report. You said that you were going to, you know, let your father die. You had private investigators following your own father. You did this. You did that. You've beaten people up. You've had, There's witnesses here. I mean, it would be, it would be, you know, a flood And he would have to respond to all of them. And he thinks that he's really good at responding or dealing with legal matters and, you know, that he's smarter than everybody and anybody that that walks the face of the earth and that he has got the the intelligence and the quick-wittedness to outwit anybody. Well, the truth of the matter is he really knows that when push comes to shove, he would be put into 
a corner that is impossible to get out of. So it's never going to happen. And in fact, as I've told uh, a bunch of media that have asked me about this, I said, well, you know, your story has a lot of stuff about David Miscavige, so you're pretty safe. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I can see that. And for you to say that uh, the Church of Scientology is libel-proof is, is an extraordinary statement because you could present enough evidence of bad acts, misrepresentation, fraud, etc., to 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 make a, a, a go of that in court. And to that point, Mike, uh, March 29, 2015, HBO uh, debuts going clear. That initial uh, viewers were 1.7 million viewers, and now it's gone to over, I think, 6 million people have watched it. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'm talking like 10 days later, after the church has gone on and on with full-page ads, attacks, hate websites. And by the way, these hate websites are nothing but an indictment of David Miscavige in the Office of Special Affairs. And it's what you said. It's what Alex Gibney said and, and Lawrence Wright said. These attacks prove <laughs> what Going Clear is saying. Right. <laughs> and to be so blind not to see that, you know, uh, Going Clear says they, they attack and fair game people. And they're saying they're not while they have hate websites up. Right. And they're sending PI, <laughs> PIs around to harass people and – it, I mean, even have PIs waiting at the airport when Mark Headley and I arrived at Sundance. I mean, what sort of idiot does that? Well, well that's a good question. <laughs> and I, you know, you know what sort of idiot does it, Jeff? The guy that is under pressure because Miscavige has made a comment when he rolled out of bed at noon and said. What the fuck is going on with with uh, Headley and Rinda? What are they doing? What are they up to? And the, you know, seventeen people that run around chasing up compliance to his every every spoken word are on the phone to Osa Int and Warren McShane and whoever else and demanding. Well, COB wants to know what's going on. Have you? Do you know what's going on? And they say, well, we know what flight they're on. Yeah, but have they arrived? Are they? Did they hook up with anybody else? So suddenly there is an order issued. Get a PI out there and have them waiting at the airport and take shots. And they got to take shots and, and get uh, video footage so that we have evidence to prove that we really know what's going on. So the next time we get asked, do we know what's going on? We've got proof of it. And that's how those insane things happen. They're like, it's like this, this para reality of a world in which the, the comments and sideline things that, that, uh, you know, spew forth out of Miscavige's mouth become uh, dogma and dicta and are followed up and chased up by a, a you know, a, a team of hounds and people do stuff to quote comply and then when they comply and it blows up he then blows up and says well, why the hell did you do that and you can't answer and say well because you ordered it and had 17 people chasing me up to tell me to get it done you got to say well because I'm stupid so you of course when when uh, it's a it's a typical it's a typical boss thing when everything goes right I take credit when everything goes wrong it's all your fault right you you can't win and your crime with Ms. Cabbage is not being omniscient <laughs> not being able not being able to predict everything right yeah. why didn't you see that coming why didn't you see that coming exactly or why why did you do it that way uh, because you t if you ever if you ever managed to sputter it out that it's because you told me to then you'll be you'll be given a lesson in passing sentences about exactly what it was that you were really told to do and it wasn't exactly that there's a there's a, a really funny thing that you described. I'm, I'm sure at the time it was not funny to you, <laughs> but it was f funny to me. Like, uh, so you're in a car with Tommy Davis trying to handle John Sweeney, and you're on uh, a BlackBerry, and uh, David Miscavige is rapidly texting you via his communicator, Lou. Right. And this is like 
incessant text messages to you to get this thing handled and, you know, get Sweeney's project killed off and get him discredited. Right. I mean, is it is this kind of a manic, frantic thing? Was he was it like every minute, every two minutes? Oh, yeah, like nonstop. Yeah, all of those, you know, those texts are all in John Sweeney's book, actually. Oh, yeah, they're they're online as well. Yeah. And to me, there's such a uh, a great insight into the mind of David Miscavige. And look, he's fascinating as a character study in how we're gone wrong. <laughs> gone, gone very wrong. Because he's not a leader, he doesn't inspire. He, he, he's a dictator who threatens. And if anyone wants to study psychopathology, you know, you could look into the, the dictionary under David Miscavige. So when you're when you're a church executive and you're getting these frantic, uh, you know, text messages, mm-hmm. there's really nothing you can do except tell him he wants to hear, I suppose. Or, and what do you do with that? Yeah, you you try and and say what you think is going to deal with the the endless barrage at the moment. I mean, you live minute to minute when you're in those sort of positions. You are living uh with no foresight whatsoever about the consequences of your actions and and that was very very clear with Tommy Davis who would literally take things that Miscavige told him to say to the media and just spout them out. Marty and I have uh, talked quite often about the the number of times where we were told what we were supposed to say to the media, and then when it didn't appear in the article, we'd be challenged about, well, did you say it? And of course we didn't, but would say, yeah, we did, but you know, they obviously left that bit out, or they didn't quote me. But Tommy Davis was the unfiltered version of things, so he will stand there on national TV and say, there's no such thing as disconnection, or you know, I'm mad as hell, or you're getting me angry, you're getting me very, very angry. I mean, this like th- that sort of stuff is the minute by minute micromanagement that David Miscavige is so f- infamous for. I mean, micromanager, yeah, you can look up sociopath or psychopath and you'll find them, but micromanager, he's the headliner. He is the king of micromanagement. He micromanages every single little thing that he touches, including you know what do you get what's the next sentence going to be out of your mouth you know i've often made commentary or parody or satire of the fact that that you know Corinne Powell is literally a a, a pinocchio doll uh, or a marionette or whatever being speaking words that are said by david miscavige and that is not really any exaggeration and it's not really even a uh it's not really even an analogy it is a just a fact the words that are coming out of her mouth and the words that came out of tommy davis's mouth are the words put into their ear by david miscavige and it is uh, a terrible sin not to repeat them exactly i mean i've been i've been you know up, run up one one side and down the other for having uh, taken something that he said that he madly scribbled on a pad while I was talking to Tom Tobin or Joe Childs on the phone, telling, sticking it in front of my face, saying, say that, and not being able to read his scratchy, shitty handwriting, and stumbling out something that was a close approximation getting slapped upside of the head and him turning around to Lou while I'm on the phone with the media, him turning around to Lou and say, this, this SP cannot duplicate anything. I say exactly what to say and he can't say it. He can't duplicate anything. So th- this is, this is, you know, how the, how the world is inside that, that very strange bubble. Going back to March 19, or I'm sorry, March 29, 2015, Going Clear premieres on HBO. Despite all the threats and, you know, from the church, 
And it has a big, what is it, is it the second largest uh, debut for HBO? Yes, of a documentary. So it's huge. Now, 10 days later, LA Times, Kim Christensen breaks the story that David Miscavige has, has had his father spied on. <laughs> and I mean... Yeah, that was a bad couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> it's sort of like, it goes from bad to worse. That that was and, that was the uh, right hook followed by the left uppercut. Oh man, that's g- great. Going back to your Muhammad Ali analogy, pain. Yeah, that is a combination. What made the the uh, Kim Christensen's exclusive so dynamite is the two PIs are arrested. They have a silencer. They have weapons. They have a gun collection. They're spying on Ron Miscavige Sr. And then the story of, you know, David Miscavige uh, telling the PIs, if he's going to die, my father, then let him die. If he dies, he dies. I mean, Mike, this is this is really bad for a so-called, quote, global ecclesiastical leader. You think? In, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is... <laughs> ah, you know, you know, how could happen to anybody? Yeah, the Pope is <laughs> let his dad die. But... But when you're inside the church or you're a church attorney and something this horrendous happens, the air has got to go out of the room or is it just like COB? Do you go into denial or what do you think happens inside the church? Well, I think it, it depends on who you are. I mean, I don't consider the lawyers really, other than probably Monique, uh, are that much in the inside the church. They sit a little... Or in some cases, a long ways outside, and they look at something like that, and and some of them just sort of smack their lips and rub their hands together and go, "Ooh, here comes the good billable hours here." Um, <laughs> but I I think that generally the internal, uh, you know, the people that are inside that bubble look at anything like that, and it's. Yeah, that's bullshit. And, you know, if it's not bullshit and he did say it, well, he deserved it anyway. You know, it it's just – it's taken out of context. I mean, they've got so many things that are the little catchphrases in their heads that explain away the, the most outrageous, uh, horrific – things that come across their plate if they do come across their plate you know there's there's of course some scientologists that read the la times i'm sure there is some that saw it on you know uh, yahoo or on google news or whatever some uh the vast majority of them won't read it even if they see the first part they won't read the whole story if they do read it they are the you know the Larry Burnses of the world who think that, you know, uh, this is just more of the, the wild conspiracy to destroy Scientology. It's the merchants of chaos who are seeking to undermine our efforts uh, to save mankind from itself. And that uh, it's probably all a bunch of lies made up by, you know, Dick Cheney, the the Bilderberg Society, and some other wacky, you know, conspiracy theory uh, people that that have you know taken over the U.S. government and are uh, seeking to destroy um, mankind's very essence of freedom. Or so, you know, it's like talking to these people is like talking to the the real fringe conspiracy theory people. I mean, I heard a guy on the radio the other day, and he was in, he's one of these 9-11 conspiracy guys, and he go, is going on and on, and then he goes into this, this you know, one of the, the people that was interviewing him says, well, I understand that you believe the earth is flat. I mean, I thought it was a joke comment. I thought he was, like, baiting the guy, saying, you know, you're so stupid, you probably think the Earth is flat. Well, this guy's 
starts telling him that it is, and that hey, you know, have you ever seen real proof that it isn't? And that, and the, and the radio host says, well, you know, you can see like the curvature of the Earth, like you stand on top of the Empire State Building, and the guy has some theory about how far you should be able to see, and the curvature of the Earth is X number of degrees, and how can you see how can you see a mountain from 37 miles away when the curvature of the Earth should have put it below, so that proves that the Earth is flat and blah, blah, blah. And no matter what they said to this guy, everything was, well, that wasn't exactly what I said. No, you're just buying into lies. No, how do you prove it? No, it's it, it can't be true. No, you don't have, uh, you don't understand what I know. Uh, you're not really willing to look. I mean, They've got their whole list of explanations and, and you know, thought stopping that prevents them from confronting the reality of whatever it is that they're talking about. You know, there was no moon landing, the Earth is flat, whatever. And Scientologists have their own little, little um, internally generated uh, patter and a thought process that allows them to uh, ignore and negate everything that even down to that sort of stuff. I mean, the craziest the, the craziest thing about that Kim Christensen story was Miscavige's response. Like, oh, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> he, he says that the. the what did he? What did he call it? Uh, he said it was provable bullshit. Provable bullshit. Okay, and and that was like that was so amazing, in that the bullshit that he was saying was bullshit were the statements that were taken under oath by the private investigators that he had hired. This wasn't statements like from someone like me or some other horrible SP. This was his own people that had said what had happened. They were the ones that recounted the story, and now he's going to say it's provable bullshit. I mean, this, yeah. Mike, this violated such a, a, an ironclad rule of PR, of public relations. You never use profanity in public relations. Of course. You just don't. You don't, and, and I think they crossed a very bad line and I could see Miscavige, you know, ordering Karen Powell, because I would have said, you know, sir, we don't want to use that word provable bullshit in something we're going to let go forever. Out in the no, use it. Use it. It's provable bullshit. It, to, to me, that was uh, a huge loss of faith for the church. It was unnecessary. They didn't need to go to an expletive. Yeah, but you, if you look at it from the twisted perspective of Miscavige, he went around after that and told everybody, see what a great quote that was? It got covered everywhere. I, I, I guess that's if uh, you want to look at it that way. And it's the unreality. You know, I'm looking at an L.A. Times article here. John Travolta perfectly illustrates what you're saying, Mike, when we're talking about prison of belief. Uh, he says, quote, I've been so happy with my Scientology experience in the last 40 years that I don't have anything to say that would shed light on a, uh, a documentary there that's so decidedly negative, unquote. So John Travolta refuses to see the movie. He says his Scientology experience is so wonderful, so why would he bother seeing the movie, and why would he communicate something that wasn't true for me? And, and I read that, and I thought, uh, John Travolta, I'm sure he's a very nice man. I have ever talked to him, him, said he's a wonderful guy. But he seems lost in a sort of self-indicting fog. Yeah, well, that's, that's just a little microcosm of, of all Scientologists. Look, John Travolta has the right to be perfectly happy with Scientology. I mean, you're, True. I, I have the right to be perfectly happy with the car I drive, too. But if someone was to write an article or do a film or whatever that said that, that the type of car that I drive uh, smashes into walls without uh, me doing anything, you know, like the old Audi unintended acceleration, 
I would actually probably be interested in seeing what it is that they had to say before deciding, well, no, my car is really good, and I'm being happy with it up to this point. And I think that, that this is where the problem is. I don't care whether John Travolta wants to continue to be a Scientologist or not. I don't care if anybody wants to continue to be a Scientologist or not. They can be anything they want. They can be a Scientologist. They can be a Satanist. They can be anything, just as long as they don't hurt anybody. But to be so arrogant as to say, I'm not going to look, but I'm going to tell you it's wrong, because my experience tells me otherwise, that is stupid. And that is sort of the, the, the problem is that by necessity, Scientology makes you stupid. It can't continue to exist unless it does. <laughs> it must make you stupid. Because if you become smarter, more intelligent, more open to looking, and more open to ideas, you discover things that make you or convince you that mm, maybe all is not, not, you know, there's something rotten in Denmark here. And only as long as you can be prevented from doing that with either persuading you that looking at anything is going to be damaging to you, uh, it's going to somehow uh, cost you something if you do, whether you'll be pulled into ethics or ordered to sec check, you'll have to pay money, you, you know, whatever it is, the penalty is, the, the control is to keep you stupid. And that is the indictment of John Travolta in my mind. He made a statement that clearly evidenced that he is stupid. <laughs> not that he is a bad person, not that he hasn't found uh, good things in Scientology or that something hasn't been helpful to him in Scientology. No, his statement and the statement of so many others is, I'm stupid. I have been made stupid by Scientology. Probably one of the most uh, amazing insights I ever had. I was protesting in 2008 alongside Anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. At the HGB, I'm talking to two Sea Org women with some other uh, protesters about David Miscavige beating his staff. Mm -hmm. And the one Sea Org woman said, well, that's never happened here at this facility. <laughs> 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 that's okay didn't didn't happen there so it didn't happen well um, well what she should really have said was that's never happened on my floor of this facility <laughs> you know because it has happened on the 10th 11th and 12th floors of that facility believe me <laughs> where she's not allowed to be exactly <laughs> now, okay so david miscavige is spying on his dad while he's trying to call Alex Gibney, Larry Wright, you, Paul Haggis, everyone else involved in the book, liars, bitter defrocked apostates, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's got a, a PIs who have silencers. And then what happens in the narrative, we, we skip ahead a few months, Going Clear wins three Emmys. And it's yeah. nods on favorite for an Oscar. Just share with our listeners, what is Miscavige's reaction, the church's reaction to those three Emmys? Um, I, honestly, Jeff, I'm not sure. I, I think that this may have resulted in, uh, you know, Instead of a, a screaming match and uh, accusations of, you know, this is a, some sort of a plot and a scheme, I think that may have just gone one step too far and resulted in a big sulk. Mm. You know, like a, a, I'm well, gonna, I'm going to lock myself in my office for a, a, a week and do nothing and say nothing because this is just all too much for one man to bear 
And, you know, I, I suspect that when the Oscar nominations happen in January, I guess it's in at the end of January, the, the actual nominations are announced. And Going Clear is on that list. It is going to be a, a really, really black day uh, to be around the Alita and that it will be, you know, that the Emmys magnified because, you know, you know, and I'm sure everybody else knows, the Emmys, they, they present their documentary awards at their, you know, uh, pre-Emmy show you know it's like the republican debate with the with the one percenters that that get to go on and and sit at the kiddie table and then right and then the big debate comes well that's a bit like what happens with the emmys not to take away the the significance of the emmys but the audience for that is teeny compared to the audience for the academy awards i mean this is a, a billion or two billion people all over the world watch that. And just merely being nominated, it's certainly going to be mentioned in the show. If it wins, it's going to get <laughs> a lot of attention. And I suspect that if it gets nominated, it may well win. You know, I, I clearly I'm prejudiced, but I believe that one of the things that the that the voters, particularly the ones in the documentary segment of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences are looking for, is things, movies that have an impact on society. You know, Citizen 4 won, and that clearly had a, a massive impact on how people viewed government intrusion and privacy, et cetera, et cetera, and was a pretty pretty brilliant film, though, honestly, it, you know, it, it was uh, it was a story that told itself. Going Clear has changed the perception of Scientology. It has changed the, the discussion about uh, what you can and cannot get away with. Uh, particularly with respect to tax exemption, it has uh, set a, a new course for the narrative uh, about Scientology, and nothing before it had accomplished that. Not the St. Pete or Tampa Bay Times, not Panorama, not 60 Minutes, not Time Magazine, nothing. Nothing had started a tidal wave like Going Clear. And I think, the, therefore, that the, the, the odds are pretty good that it will win an Academy Award. And if it wins an Academy Award, who knows what will happen next? I mean, that will be enormously significant. Um, it will get a whole new round of, of viewers for it. It will probably prompt... Uh, another whole series of uh, shows uh, exposing the, the slimy, rotten underbelly of the Church of Scientology, um, if not from Alex Gibney, certainly from other people. I mean, there are, it has already engendered a, a, like a new cottage industry of Scientology media. I mean, there are three other programs in the works right now as we talk to be released next year about exposing uh, the abuses of disconnection, financial abuses, and other stuff that's going on in Scientology. It, it, like I said, it started a cottage industry, and I think that because of that, it has a pretty good shot of of winning an Oscar. Um, and boy, that would be a that would be probably the blackest day in the in the history of David Miscavige and. I think that he may really, really live to regret the fact that he did not in any way, shape, or form try to, uh, you know, this, this was the, the great test of his theory of media handling 
uh, his theory being ignore them, ignore them, ignore them, tell them that you're unavailable, that you're too busy, accuse them of being bigots, send them threatening letters, and then when it gets to the point of they're about to put the thing to bed, uh, suddenly show up with a, a phalanx of people making demands to be heard, that they want to be interviewed at the very last minute, uh, people that they that <laughs> won't even ask for in in the case of going clear, and then send more legal threat letters and more and more, and then end up with absolutely no say in what ended up being included in the film, other than the <laughs> the silly statements the uh, clips from from uh, events and the the note at the end of the film that we asked all these people for interviews and they all declined. And so therefore, who do you got to blame when nothing appears, when there is no presence, when your quote, your side of the story isn't told? That is quite a statement. The stories... In going clear, the humility of Paul Haggis, Tom DeVock, Jason Begay, Sarah Goldberg, the, the humanity that shone through in the film is so strong, and it was such a brave film. And I think the Academy will give them the Oscar because it is, it's a brave film. It's heroic, and uh, Alex Gibney and company, uh, Sheila Evans, had to – persevere against you know just a lot of bullshit right and you know the the church makes it miserable this is hubbard's policy attack the attacker yep they're gonna they're gonna make it miserable every step of the way yep and i think because it, of, the, of the perseverance and the bravery and and i really applaud hbo for going with it but it really did capture the uh, the human experience of people dealing you know in, in the prison of belief uh, Marty Rathbun was incredibly honest in what he said is, how many more deaths do I have to die? Right. This is a film that asks the viewer to really look at something that they haven't really considered. You get past the celebrities, you get past the PR, and you get into the real experience of it. And it really just tears your guts out. Yeah, I think that what what Alex managed to do was – Make it a film that people can relate to. And what I mean by that is it's really easy for those who have never had any involvement in Scientology to say that that could never be me. I'd never fall for that bullshit. I'd never get involved. Those people are just stupid. He made it uh, particularly through the voice of Paul um, – and, you know, everybody else to some extent, but really Paul as the primary one and, and well, I guess Jason too, that, you know, this could be me. This, this could be, you know, I can see how uh, an otherwise intelligent, uh, bright person could get themselves sucked in. And that it was to me what made this film so um, important because I think that it talks to everybody. It's not a film that is limited to the public like you and me that would like to see the abuses we already know about being exposed. We, we, we like everything that, that does that. The trick of the of this subject is to get people who have no involvement and no vested interest and no experience to sit for two hours and watch something like that about a subject of which they may have known nothing and be interested and have their viewpoint shifted or created about, well, what should I think about this? And that, to me, is the is the real filmmaking skill that he employed in that film. I quite agree. And to end with calling uh, for uh, John Travolta and Tom Cruise to be morally accountable. 
to raise questions about IRS 501c3 tax exemption. All very important things, especially tax exemption, because if the church loses their tax exemption, and I believe they will, then it's game game over. So I think Alex really hit it at the key structural issues. And by letting people tell their stories, it does become an every man's story. Yep. yep. And because so so many Americans, especially Americans, have been touched by religion. Mike, we're coming up on the end of the hour, so I have to ask you the obligatory question and what's becoming a tradition. <laughs> Mike Rinder, what do you see ahead for the Church of Scientology in 2016? <laughs> um, more pain, Jeff. Much more pain. <laughs> I, I believe that you know we we talked we touched upon going clear and the Oscars and the other TV shows and and media interest which is coming and of course there's Ron Senior's book coming out and uh, I think that Narconon and the, the legal problems with Narconon and applied scholastics are just going to multiply and that's going to become you know another Death Star circling around the the uh, the ever ever dwindling planet of of David Miscavige, and I I think that ultimately what we are going to see is that at some point in this coming year it is going to become politically expedient to for some politicians to stand up and start saying something needs to be done about this. And why I think that that is significant is that what motivates the IRS is political pressure. If it is someone that sits on one of the IRS oversight committees, then their agitation toward the IRS about you better get, you better get, you know, wake up and start doing something about this is going to become uh, something that will that will cause action to be taken. It is hard to get a bureaucracy like the IRS moving, but the one way I know that it can be gotten moving is through political pressure coming from, like those who control the purse strings of any government agency are those who dictate the direction and action of that government agency and the IRS is just like everybody else. If you have someone that's on the appropriations committee uh, that allows the IRS to be funded or not funded for their various programs to go after uh, people that they want to go after, then th they have a lot of clout and if one or more of those sort of people gets interested and thinks that there is political currency to be made out of being the champion of uh, the IRS doing something about the tax exempt status of the Church of Scientology, then that is when it will happen. And I believe that when you have as much media coverage as there has been, you have uh, as many people uh, in this coming year trying to get elected as there will be, and you have a, a climate where people are, in, are increasingly unwilling to, um, you know, excuse uh, the 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 foibles, the 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 abuses, the lies, the the escaping uh, accountability that uh, either big corporations or religions have gotten away with, then that is a climate for uh, action to be taken and for some people to to step up and say, you know, this is a this is a cause I'm taking on and I am going to make a difference about it and. I think that when that happens, then that really truly is going to herald the end of the Church of Scientology as we know it. I don't think there will ever be an end of the subject of Scientology. I hope there is no end to the subject of Scientology. I don't believe in in uh, the thought of you can eradicate a, 
a, a philosophy or a, a, a series of writings or thoughts, no matter how wrong people may think they are, they will exist and should exist in any open and free society. But if you can get rid of the institutions that abuse people, that is something that is for the public benefit and that is ultimately what will happen to the Church of Scientology because it has no other reason to exist. It is not uh, providing any public benefit. It is not uh, doing anything to help society. Uh, the philosophy of Scientology can exist uh, probably better without the Church of Scientology. Uh, just being a, you know, you can go read it in your library or find it online or whatever and do with it as you wish. Um, and there would be a lot less heartache in the world with people no longer having enforced disconnection and being put into bankruptcy in order to, to uh, fund their harebrained schemes. Well, well said, uh, Mike. I will add this. <clears throat> You know, the church has left uh, a huge swath of human wreckage in its path, ruined lives, even suicides, deaths, bankruptcies. I'll tell you this without revealing my, my source, but I do have a highly placed source in Washington, D.C. I can tell you and our listeners that my source in D.C. said that going clear sent shock waves through the IRS. The IRS did set up and take notice. Well, that's good to hear, Jeff. It's very good to hear. And I agree with you, it'll take uh, an elected official, a political champion in the IRS or at the level of Congress. And part of the work I do in my Scientology Money Project is to just use legally available documents to show the bad faith, the contracts of adhesion, the human suffering it causes. So, and I think going clear has the horsepower to really communicate the message. And when it wins the Oscar, and I certainly hope it does, uh, you know, we'll see what 2016 brings. But I think the walls keep narrowing in on the Church of Scientology in its present form. I, and ultimately, it will be dismantled. I agree, Jeff. Like I said, more pain. <laughs> more pain. And Mike, Mike Rinder, we'll leave it at that. More pain for 2016. You heard it here first on Surviving Scientology Radio. Mike, thank you so much for your time. We always love having you, and Happy New Year and the best of all to you and your family. And same to you, Jeff, and to everybody else who's listening. Well, thank you, and we look forward to having you again soon as developments happen in the first quarter. Maybe we'll have a uh, first quarter review. And, uh, Sounds hold like Ms. a <laughs> we'll Hold Mr. Miscavige to corporate standards of quarterly reviews. Yeah. Give him a break from... <laughs> Hey, we're easier. We don't, he, we don't have Thursday 2 p.m. with him. We'll have quarterly reviews. Exactly. <laughs> and, when, and, it's, and as soon as he gets uh, gets around to doing, uh, you know, the quarterly uh, in, uh, analyst calls, that'll be a real interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll leave it at that, Mike. Mike, thank you so much. All right, but For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.